Right, so welcome to this yet another session where we are looking at uh, just a review of development and congenital anomalies of the male and the female reproductive system. I believe you listened to the longer recordings of the same, there were two recordings. So this particular session is just to give a summary of what was supposed to be a take home message. One of the key agendas that we needed to address in this lecture is the embryonic origin of the urogenital system as a whole. Now to answer that question, remember that both the urinary system as well as the reproductive systems originate from the intermediate mesoderm. So that is the embryonic origin. Now on that intermediate mesoderm, we have a swelling that we call the urogenital ridge. So that ridge represents the swelling that will be future urinary system as well as organs of the reproductive system, and in particular, the gonads. As time goes by, the urogenital ridge splits into two swellings, one on the medial aspect, which is called the genital ridge. This is the one that is the future gonad, and one to the lateral side, which is called the mesonephric ridge, which is the future urinary system. So it, from intermediate mesoderm, then there's a common swelling. That swelling then divides into two ridges the genital ridge representing the reproductive system and the urinary ridge or mesonephric ridge representing the urinary system. Second agenda was for you to explain the indifferent stage of genital development. Now to answer that question, remember that uh, the indifferent stage of development is that time when the reproductive systems are not committal on to which particular gender direction the organs will become. It is a time that we have common embryonic structures, embryonic structures with, with bipotential capacity. They can become male organs, they can become female organs. There are three levels of indifferent stage of genital development. We have the indifferent stage of the gonadal development. We call that structure the indifferent gonad, the structure which can either become the testes or the ovary. That indifferent gonad has two parts. The central part is called the medulla. The outer zone is called the cortex. Remember this one is part of the structure that's actually forming on what we call the genital ridge. The second type of indifferent stage of development is the indifferent stage of development of the internal genitalia. The indifferent stage of internal genitalia is characterized by the presence of two embryonic genital ducts. We have what we call the Mullerian duct, and we have what we call the Wolfian duct. So this is the Wolfian duct, this is the Mullerian duct. Now the Wolfian duct is the duct of the mesonephros. So it's the mesonephric duct. The Mullerian duct is a duct parallel to the mesonephros. So we call it paramesonephric duct. Of importance to note is that the paramesonephric ducts are fused somewhere down there, but uh, uh, cranially they are not fused, they are paired right and left. These embryonic ducts are the ones which are designated to become the internal genitalia, male or female. Then the third type of indifferent stage of development is the indifferent stage of the external genitalia. 
it's a time period again when we have common structures in the external genitalia that can either become male or female external genitalia with normal potency. At this time of development, there are three structures. We have what you call the genital tubercle. We have what you call the urethral fold. And there is what we call the labioscrotal swelling. So whether this baby will become male or female, the external genitalia at this time has those three structures, genital tubercle, urethral fold, and labioscrotal swelling. So those are the in different stages of development. The next agenda is then to explain how we translate those in different stages to particular gender differentiation. So we are talking about how do we determine sex before birth and how do these structures differentiate? To answer that question, remember there are three types of prenatal sex the uh, de determination and differentiation stages. There's what you call the genotypic sex, which tries to explain which sex chromosomes the baby has. Then the gonadal sex, which try to understand which gonad the baby has. And then phenotypic sex, which is also called anatomical sex, which try to tell us which internal and external genital organs does the baby develop. So starting with the genotypic sex, which is also known as chromosomal sex, if the baby has two X chromosomes, that is genetically female. If the baby has one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, that is genetically male. Remember, Genotypic sex or chromosomal sex is determined at the time of conception and it's based on which type of sperm fertilizes the oocyte. So if the oocyte is fertilized by the Y sperm, then the zygote will be 46XY genetically female, sorry, genetically male. And if the, if the oocyte is fertilized by the egg sperm, then the zygote, hence the embryo, will be 46XX genetically female. The next type of sex is uh, the gonadal sex. We are trying to seek to answer the question, which type of gonad will the indifferent gonad become? I've already explained to you what is in different gonad, having a cortex and amygdala by potential for forming the testes of the ovary. Therefore, the indifferent gonad can either become the ovary, then we call that gonadally female, or can become the testes, then we call that gonadally male. To answer the question, what determines what the indifferent gonad become, we needed to remember that this determination takes place not at the time of fertilization, but perhaps a few weeks later. And perhaps the better term to use is differentiation. What lineage of gonad will the indifferent gonad differentiate to? The differentiation of the indifferent gonad is based on the presence of what we call the testicular determining factor. The testicular determining factor is a molecule, is a molecule signal that is coded by a gene housed by the Y chromosome. That gene is known as the sex determining region of the Y chromosome. It's a gene, SRY gene. So let me put it in principle. If the baby is genetically male, it will have the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome will then have this SRY gene. The SRY gene code for TDF, testicular determining factor. 
it's a molecular signal that acts on the different gonad to make it differentiate into the testes. So if the baby is 46XY, we will expect testicular differentiation because of that concept I've explained. However, if the baby is 46XX, there is no Y chromosome. And in that case, there'll be no testicular differentiation factor. If there is no TDF, testicular determining factor differentiation factor, then by default, the indifferent gonad becomes the ovary. In the development of the ovary, it is the cortex of the indifferent gonad that proceeds to develop. So we'll have the ovarian cortex or rather the cortex of the indifferent gonad continue to develop, the medulla involutes. The opposite applies for testicular differentiation. It is the medulla of the indifferent gonad that differentiates, while the cortex of the indifferent gonad involutes. That is gonadal sex determination. Once gonadal sex has been determined, the next agenda is to determine the, the sex of the indifferent internal genitalia as well as the sex of the indifferent external genitalia. Remember, the internal genitalia is represented by the Mullerian duct and Wolfian duct. The external genitalia is represented by three swellings, the genital tubercle, urethral fold, and the labioscrotal swelling. The big question here is, which organs will form from either the indifferent internal or external genitalia? Which organs will form? They could be male sex organs. They could be female sex organs. The differentiation towards these organs occur slightly later than the differentiation of the gonad, and it is based on the presence of significant androgen hormone activity. We must have enough or adequate levels of androgen hormones to make impact on the indifferent genitalia, whether internal or external. If there is enough androgens, the androgens will act on both internal genitalia as well as external genitalia to cause virilization. Virilization is male patterning, making the organs become male. If there is no androgen hormone activity or the levels of androgens are not adequate, they are sub-threshold, then there'll be no virilization. And so by default, that becomes female. Now, think through this. What determines whether we have enough androgen hormone activity? The major determinant is the presence of the testes. The fetal testes is hormonally active, producing androgens. So if the baby is 46XY, genetically male, we will assume then that it will later develop a testis gonadally male. The testis from there produces enough androgens and these androgens will do what? The androgens will cause virilization. Now, the testis is not the only source of androgens before birth. There's also another source of androgen that the fetal adrenal cortex, which also produces androgens in either gender, whether male or female. However, if the baby is genetically female, 46XX, there'll be no testes, they'll just be ovary. That fetus will be producing androgens only from the adrenal cortex. The adrenal androgens are not adequate enough to cause virilization. And so you need a summation of the androgens from the adrenal cortex and the androgens from the fetal testes to cause significant androgen hormone activity 
adequate to cause virilization. In the absence of that, there'll be no virilization. So basically that is how gender determination or sex determination occurs. So next agenda was for you to then state the differentiation of the internal genitalia. We've alluded to it slightly by saying that the indifferent internal genitalia has two ducts. The mesonephric duct, which is also known as the Wolfian duct, and paramesonephric duct, which is also known as the Mullerian duct. Remember, the Mullerian ducts are paired in the caudal end but fused caudally. Now, let's see how the indifferent internal genitalia differentiates. If the baby is 46XY, it will mean that this baby is genetically male. In that case, there'll be SRY gene. And that means that uh, you'll have testicular differentiation factor, a molecule that is present in this particular fetus. This testicular differentiation factor will direct the differentiation of the indifferent gonad to become the testis. So it will cause this embryo to be gonadally male. Once the testis has formed, the testis will produce androgens. But the androgens from the test are not the only source of androgens. And we also have androgens from the fetal adrenal cortex. As I mentioned earlier, the summation of the androgens from the fetal adrenal cortex and the fetal testes will cause significant androgen hormone activity to be, to be experienced. These androgens stimulate the Wolfian duct to differentiate into the male genital ducts. And so what the Wolfian duct will become, it will become the epididymis, the vas difference, it will also form part of the ejaculatory duct and part of seminal vesicles. Those are the derivatives of the Wolfian duct in male. At the same time, the Sertoli cells, which are in the testes of this fetus, produce another hormone which we call Mullerian inhibiting hormone. Mullerian inhibiting hormone suppresses the development of the Mullerian duct. And so if the baby is 46 XY, the Mullerian duct does not proceed. It doesn't develop, it regresses. That is how the internal genitalia differentiates in a 46 XY embryo. How about if the embryo is 46XX? In this case, we do not have the SRY gene, and so we do not have the TDF as well. This is genetically female. In this context, because there is no TDF, the indifferent gonad will differentiate to ovarian lineage. It will form the ovary instead of the testis. If the ovary is present, what does that mean? We do not have enough androgen hormones because the test is absent. So in the context of inadequate androgen hormone activity, this will be coupled with the presence of estrogen hormones. Why estrogens? The placenta produces estrogens. The woman who is pregnant is producing estrogens. Definitely, there'll be high levels of estrogens. So if you couple high levels of estrogens with insufficient action of androgens, that hormonal milieu puts a very conducive environment for the development of the female internal genitalia. In the differentiation of the female internal genitalia, it is the Mullerian duct that now carries a day, it will differentiate into the female reproductive tract. The unpaired segments of the Mullerian duct form the fallopian tube, while the first part of the Mullerian duct is the one that will become both the uterus 
together with its cervix and even the upper part of the vaginal canal. In this context of hormonal milieu, the Wolfian ducts will not carry the day. They'll actually regress in the absence of androgens and presence of estrogens. Wolfian duct regresses. Let's say something more about the uterus. When the right and the left millennium duct fuse, that fused part is termed the uterine canal or the uterovaginal primordium because it's going to give us the uterus and the vagina. There's a septum, of course, that is initially there because there are two ducts that came, that septum. Usually that septum will regress slowly through the process of apoptosis. And so in this image, we can see the, two, the septum there, which regresses slowly. Other than the regression, the upper part of the fused parts, remember at this point, it's a cleft, but now that usually evert so that we have formation of the uterine fundus. So basically, the uterus will form from the fused parts of the millennium ducts. How about the vaginal canal? The vaginal canal is a unique one. It will arise from the tip of the fused parts of the millennium duct. So that will be a solid structure. Together with the part where that fused part makes contact with the regenerative sinus, again, solid structure. So that region there is originally solid. That solid structure is known as the vaginal plate. As you then understand, the vaginal plate has two sites of origin, proximally, Millerian duct. This is the proximal one third, and the distal two thirds uh, by the urogenital sinus. So important to note, therefore, that the vagina has a dual embryonic origin. Now, when the vaginal plate forms, it will undergo canalization, which means that a lumen forms within the plate, and that canalization leads to the formation of the cavity of the vagina. Hymen, how does hymen come about? The hymen come about as a result of this thin membrane that is present between the canal of the vaginal plate and the cavity of the urogenital sinus. So the hymen is not at the junction between the upper one third and lower two thirds of vaginal embryonic origins as some people may want to confuse, not quite true. The hymen is actually the membrane between the cavity of the vaginal plate and the cavity of the urogenital sinus. Usually the hymen also regresses around the time of birth or a few years after that, it regresses spontaneously. This shows you a sagittal view of the same concept of vaginal development. So initially you have that region there that will give us the vaginal plate. The vaginal plate then undergoes cavitation. And so this is what will become the vagina upper one third from the millerian duct tissues and the lower two thirds from the tissues of the urogenital sinus the hymen will be lower down. Okay, how about differentiation of the indifferent external genitalia? The indifferent external genitalia has three swellings, as I mentioned. One, genital tubercle. Two, the urethral fold. And three, the labioscrotal swelling. Now, before, the cloaca is partitioned, you'll call it the cloaca fall. But after the cloaca has been partitioned, the anterior part is the opening of the urogenital sinus, which you call the urethral fold. And the posterior part is around the anal canal called the anal fold. So we are focusing on the anterior one. Genital tubercle is the first swelling to appear. This genital tubercle is a primordium of the penis or the clitoris. 
urethral fold is also another swelling, primordium of the penile urethra and labia minora. Then the genital swellings, which are also called labioscrotal swellings, are the primordia of the scrotum or labia majora. Now, what determines the direction that this will go? We've already explained the presence of androgen hormone activity. So in the presence of androgens, the genital tubercle become the penis. If the androgens are not adequate, then the genital tubercle become the clitoris. In the presence of androgens, the urethral folds will fuse to form the penile urethra, which is incorporated within the corpus spongiosum. If there are no enough androgens, then this urethral folds become labia minora. Lastly, the, in the presence of androgens, the genital swellings, what we call labioscrotal swellings, fuse and grow caudally to become the scrotum. If there are no enough androgens, then the genital swellings remain apart, but they elongate on either side to become the labia majora. That's the differentiation of the external genital. So this image shows you the differentiation of the external genitalia, a genital tubercle becoming the penis in male and a clitoris in female. The urethral fold or genital fold in this case become incorporated as part of the urethra, penal urethra in male and part of the corpus spongiosum and in female, labia minora, which surround the vestibule. Labioscrotal swelling, also called genital swelling, become the scrotum in male and labia majora in female. Last but not least, we, you needed to highlight on congenital malformations of the reproductive system. We start with intersex disorders, which are congenital malformations in which the three types of sex are not typical. We make a diagnosis of intersex disorder or disorders of sexual development on two accounts. One, if the external genitalia is ambiguous. When you look at it and you don't want to say this is male or female, you cannot because of the anatomy you are seeing. It is not typical, it is not classical for either male or female. We call that ambiguous genitalia or atypical genitalia. That one is easy to pick, but the second one is a bit hard to pick. The second one is when the genital appearance is not in harmony with the, gen the genotypic sex. What I mean is this. If the embryo is 46XX, you'll expect the genitalia to be female. If the embryo is 46XY, you'll expect the genitalia to be male. You may have a scenario where the embryo is 46XX, but the genitalia is male. Or a scenario where the embryo is 46XY, but the genitalia is female. So that is what the second one means. And that second one is tricky to pick. You may not pick it at the time of birth, but as the child grows, it might be picked up. Right, so this shows you example of ambiguous genitalia. Maybe the first one may not be very obvious to you, but look at the second one. It's hard to tell which gender that is. You see a cleft, you want to call it female, but look, this field things represent testes. So that's ambiguous genitalia. Now, what are the causes of intersex disorders or disorders of sexual development? You may have a structural abnormality that affects the sex chromosomes. Remember the 23rd pair of chromosomes that can give you intersex disorder. You may also have a scenario where we do not have enough androgen action, yet the fetus is 46. X, Y, genetically male. For example, if this baby is genetically male, but the testes did not form for whatever reason, we have what you call gonadal dysgenesis. 
that will be ambiguous. Or rather, let me say that will be a disorder of sexual development because the genitalia in this particular baby will be female in as much as they genetically they're male. Also, you may have what we call testicular feminizing syndrome. This is a situation where, yes, these are testes, but uh, this test is, although it's producing testosterone or androgens, you do not have receptors of androgens functional. Yes, there are androgens, but androgen activity cannot be experienced because of defective receptors. So we call that testicular feminizing syndrome or androgen insensitivity syndrome. That baby will be XY genotype, but the genitalia will be female. Lastly, we may have a lot of androgen activity in a child who is genetically female. Best example to think about is if you have overgrowth of the fetal adrenal cortex, this overgrowth is termed congenital adrenal hyperplasia. In congenital adrenal hyperplasia, there'll be enough androgens adequate to cause virilization even if there is no testis because of overgrowth of the adrenal cortex, hence excess androgen action. Another scenario could be that you just have some enzyme deficiency. Remember, for you to synthesize estrogens, you still have to first synthesize androgens. So if there is enzyme deficiency, so that we do not have conversion of androgens to estrogens in the fetus, then you may have excess androgen action in an XX genotype. These are the major causes of intersex disorders. All right, apart from intersex disorders, the other disorders that affect the genitalia will be cryptokidism. This is undescended testis. Remember, if it's undescended, most of the time, it could just be within the inguinal canal, or it could be high up in the scrotum, or maybe in the abdomen itself. Uh -huh. Now, I want us to talk about Millerian duct malformations, but before that, I want you to remember what we said about millennium duct. There are two ducts, right and left duct, they fuse. We can consider that upper fused part to be the one forming the uterine body as well as the fundus. And this middle third fused part will be forming the cervix of the uterus. And this lower third fused part will be forming the upper part of the vagina. Let's go with upper one third, not upper two thirds, but upper one third of the vagina. So this is the millennium duct in, in blue. Uh, remember that the vagina had two embryonic origins. So the lower part of the vagina, now that to be lower two thirds of the vagina, come from urogenital sinus. Remember that one. This and Fused parts of the millennium ducts are the ones which will become the fallopian tubes. So this is how the millennium duct is supposed to differentiate. Now, with that in mind, how about if there's a problem with the fusion of the right and the left millennium duct, what should we expect? Possible options are here. In the first one, the right and the left millennium ducts have totally not fused. You will have a double uterus, double cervix, double upper vagina. This is what we call uterus didelphis. In the second and the third one, the lower third of the millennium ducts fused, the part that gives us the vagina. So this one will give you what you call biconuate uterus. But depending on how much they are fused. You may have biconuate with double cervix, so we call that biconuate bicolis, or biconuate with a single cervix, we call that biconuate unicolis. Apart from those, you may also have a problem with the degeneration of the septum between the right and the left millennium duct. So we have what you call septated uterus, as we can see here. It can be a complete septum, or a partial septation. 
Other than that, you may also have problems in the vagina. For example, you may have vaginal atresia blockage. That means that the canalization did not occur the vaginal plate properly. Or you may have a problem with the hymen, which is not yet perforated. So this is imperforate hymen. Well, the other four, let's just call them some variations. They may not be congenital anomalies, but uh, variations. There are many variants anatomy of the hymen that we can expect to have. Male genitalia is also not left behind in malformations. You may have a problem where the urethra opens in the lower part. We call that hypospadia malformations. But you may also have a problem where the urethra open in the upper parts. We call that epispadia malformations. Great. I have made a summary of uh, the development and congenital malformations of the reproductive systems to you. Thank you.